And uh, today's topic is the cross of Christ. Uh, uh, is it a shame? And the question mark is, is it a shame? And uh, uh, just a cross, uh, meaning that when Christ hung on the cross, was it a shame? As the, in fact, the Bible says, uh, 12th chapter of Hebrews, verse 2 says, Hebrews 12, 2, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Its shame. Shame of what? Of the cross. We're going to look into scriptures and see in what uh, perspective is the cross considered a shame. And uh, we're going to study that aspect of the cross itself, uh, people being crucified on the cross those days in the first century, and how it's so different with the Lord Jesus Christ and the amazing inheritance we all receive uh, in the context of uh, what he did for us on the cross. And this week, uh, the whole week, uh, the whole world is almost focusing on the message of the cross, his death and his resurrection. And we also will look in one aspect of that. In fact, from tomorrow, every day, uh, from tomorrow till next Sunday, I will speak in, in Pune, the Old Time Memorial Methodist Church, different aspects of uh, the cross. And I uh, hope they record it. And I will give it to you later on if it's recorded. But uh, all over the world, people, uh, the churches are focusing on uh, the cross of Christ. And therefore, let's look at one aspect of the cross. And why is it, from a worldly perspective, it was a shame? In the context of this letter of uh, Hebrews, where the writer exhorts the people who are recipients of this letter to fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame. Next, next verse says, Consider him who endures such opposition from sinful men, that he not grow weary and lose heart. These people who received this letter were actually uh, from Judaism. They were Jews who had come to believe in Jesus. And when they first accepted Christ, they were very uh, full of uh, joy and uh, zeal for the Lord, enthusiasm. But over a period of time, because of persecution, because of very difficulties they faced, they were a little bit uh, lukewarm. They had gone down in their zeal for the Lord. And the writer is exhorting the Jewish Christians to realize that they come to believe in Jesus, who is far above the prophets, far above angels, far above Moses, and far above the priesthood. He is a perfect high priest. So all these entities are very dear to the Jews. Moses was a big hero for them. Prophets, they looked up to the prophets. Some of them at least. Then there was the priesthood, which was ordained by God. Then there were angels. And the writer is exhorting them to believe that they come to believe in the Son of God who is far above all these entities. And since they believe in Jesus, they should not lose heart because of opposition. And he goes on to say, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men that he won't grow weary and lose heart. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Who for the joy set before him endured this cross, scorning its shame. Why, were, why was the cross a shame? Let's understand that crucifixion was not a Jewish punishment, it was a Roman punishment. And the Jews of those days, when they were jealous of Jesus, they found tried to find some part with him, they could not find any part with him, he was sinless. Yet they had two complaints about him. One was he healed on the Sabbath day. And number two, he called God his father. That was the complaint against him. He healed on the Sabbath day and he called God his father. And they came and complained to the Romans. And then according to the uh, Jewish law, for extreme punishment, in extreme sin, punishment was actually stoning. Crucifixion is not a uh, Jewish punishment. It was a Roman punishment. And they brought Jesus to Pilate and told him that he had to crucify him because he has broken our, our laws. He's in all kinds of things they brought against. They tried to get some people to make false testimony against Jesus. But then the crucifixion was a common punishment for very grave offenses those days. Murder, rape, um, uh, all the so-called terrible 
uh, crimes, the punishment was crucifixion. And the crucifixion was actually done by the Roman Romans. And the, the person being crucified, they put on a cross. And the cross would be actually planted along the highway, along the uh, highways which the Romans had. For example, from Rome, they had a highway called Apian Highway, Apian, from Rome going down south. Uh, and uh, in Jerusalem, there was also a highway. Highway from Egypt all the way to Mesopotamia. And that highway actually passed very close to Jerusalem, just out of Jerusalem. And all the people traveling from, uh, from uh, Egypt to Mesopotamia or vice versa, they would go on that highway. And as they go up the highway north, they would come to a place called Megiddo. And uh, Megiddo was the place where they both the highways crisscrossed. There was a highway from Europe uh, to Egypt, another highway from Egypt to Mesopotamia. And they both like a Y, like Y shape. The center was Megiddo. And uh, so the people being crucified, they put on a cross, the cross was planted on the highway. So when people walked across the highway when they travel, they look at this person hanging on the cross. And in the, on the cross, there'd be a name of the person and the crime he had committed. The name of the person and the crime he had committed. So people look at that person and they will heap abuse upon the person. They will shame that person, abuse, hurt, hurt, uh, hurt abuse and uh, make all kinds of uh, you know, accusations. And apart from the fact that person be crucified, he will incur the wrath of the people and uh, curses of the people. And uh, that's what will happen. So it was a shame to hang on a cross. And people along the highway were traveling. All of them will look at the cross and curse the person. The name will be there. Name and the crime. Now, in the case of Jesus, he had not committed any crime. And Pilate told the Jews, you take him and judge him by your own law. I find no basis for punishment against him. I find no basis. But they said, crucify him, crucify him. And the reason why Christ had to be crucified and not stoned, because scripture had to be fulfilled. In the book of Isaiah, 53 verse 5, it says, He was crushed for iniquities, he was bruised for our transgression, the punishment of his peace was upon him. He was pierced for our transgression, he was pierced. Pierced means what? Not stoning. Pierce means nails had to go into his hands and legs, and in the side they would put a sword, pierced. In stoning, there's no piercing. There is stone a person before. It had to be in the scriptural. That's why it had to be the Roman way. God ordained that. Not only that, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse himself. Because cursed be any man who hangs on a tree. When a person hangs on a tree, is under a curse. Book of Deuteronomy, 21st chapter, which Timothy talks about, anyone hanging on a tree is under a curse. So Christ became a curse to redeem mankind from all curses. And therefore, he had to be crucified. Now, Pilate had a problem. According to Roman law, he has to put the crime he committed, and that crime would be that, that uh, on a parchment, write down the name and the crime, and that, that parchment would be nailed along with the person being crucified on the cross. To fulfill Roman law, Pilate had to put on that cross a parchment with the crime Jesus had committed. He committed no crime, but someone came and told him, if you let him go, you are no friend of Caesar. You let him go, you are no friend of Caesar. Because right now he is a very, very powerful uh, revolutionary in uh, Israel. Everyone is running to him, very popular. If you let him go, he might be a threat to Caesar. If you let him go, you are no friend of Caesar's. And that changed Pilate's mind. That statement changed Pilate's mind. Then he says, take it. And he tells people to crucify him. 
So on the cross, what did they put? They had to put something on the cross, the crime they committed. Is of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That was his crime. Today is king of the Jews. Tomorrow he may be a threat to Caesar. So Pilate massaged his conscience. Oh, I found something. Now I can put him on the cross. Because now he is a big threat to uh, the Roman rule. So they let him go. He might be a large, I mean, stage of a coup, coup against the emperor. And therefore that's his crime. So on the cross was nailed this statement. He's of Nazareth, king of the Jews. And people who walked by would have wondered, how can this be a crime? But then because he was on the cross, people don't see the crime. They look at him and scoff and mock rather than practice those days. So cross itself was a shame. And Jesus, he scorned the shame for the joy set before him. The contrast here is for the, for the believers who have become believers from a Jewish background, when they face opposition, when they face criticism, not to lose heart, but consider the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame. He became a sin offering to redeem us from all sins. He became a curse to redeem us from all curses. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us. In him we can become righteousness of God. We can become in him righteousness of God. Now as he scorned the shame of the cross, not only the, of the cross is said, before that is said, they ridiculed him. They, they uh, whipped him and they asked him, prophesy who hit you? They scoffed, they mocked, are you king of the Jews? What kind of thing they did? But he kept quiet. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, did not open his mouth. What a lesson for us. Lesson for us was un unjustly reviled. We get punishment for things, wrong things we do. In him there was no sin. He scorned the shame of the cross and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exhorted him. And the amazing thing is, the joy set before him was that you and me would be with him in heaven forever and ever. By one sacrifice on the cross, he has made all of us perfect forever. Hebrews 10, 14 says, by one sacrifice he has made us perfect forever. When he entered the world, he told the Father in heaven, 10th chapter of uh, Hebrews, verse 5. Sacrifices and burnt offerings you didn't desire. But a body you have prepared for me. A body you have prepared for me. Quran, I come to do your will. And John, Hebrews 10, 10 says, Hebrews 10, 10. By that will, we have been made holy to sacrifice the body of Christ once for all. Once for all. Now coming back. By putting people on the cross and crucifying them, the Romans made a public spectacle of them. A public spectacle for all to see along the Apian Highway, Apian Way they called it in Rome, in Jerusalem, the highway from uh, Egypt to Mesopotamia, a public spectacle. From the human perspective, it was a shame, the cross. But from a biblical perspective, from a spiritual perspective, we all know to the ultimate victory over evil and also over sin. On every evil entity in the world, Christ gave us victory. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Now we look at Colossians chapter 2, 13 to 15. We read about something amazing. That a lot of things stood opposed to us and against us. Our sins were against us. Our sins condemn us. By the way, God won't condemn anybody. Our sin condemns, condemns us. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 12, it says, Our sins testify against us. Many people ask me this question. How can a God of love 
sent people to hell. First of all, hell was not made for man. 25th chapter of Matthew was 41. It was made for Satan and his angels. God does not send us to hell. Our sins escort us to hell. Isaiah 59 verse 12 says, Our sins testify against us. Right now, all of us are sinners. We don't realize we, one is more sinner than the other person. And we think they are fine people. One day when the spirit comes out of the body, without belief in Christ, at least one sin is there. That sin will stand out completely against in the presence of God. It will stand out. Now, right now, it's all conceived. Everybody is sinner. It's like uh, Isaiah. When he saw the glory of God, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 8, we read. When he saw the glory of God, he says, Woe to me, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among the people of unclean lips. And I have seen the glory of God. He was a man of unclean lips, living among people of unclean lips. We do not know that. When he saw the glory of God, he understood that. Similarly, one day when the spirit comes out of his body, he can't enter into God's presence. Absolutely holy, perfect, unapproachable light God lives in. And our sins will stand out. It will testify against us. So actually, God doesn't send people to hell. People's sins escort them to hell. They can't find them comfortable in heaven. We can't enter heaven. Only by the blood of Christ, every sin in the heart has been cleansed. So what opposed, was stood opposed to us was our sins. And it says in the letter of Paul to Colossians, chapter 2, 13 to 15, a beautiful passage, three verses, so powerful it is, that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ made a public spectacle of the evil forces on the cross. The evil forces tempted man to sin, right? And because of one sin, our uh, spirits are contaminated. And unless the sin is removed, it cannot be, uh, we cannot go to heaven. And by the sacrifice, every sin in the heart actually was nailed to the cross. On the cross, that parchment says, this is another king of the Jews. For unseen to the human eye, all the sin in the world were nailed on the cross. That punishment he took upon himself was actually punishment. Which he, our punishment he took away and gave us peace. So unseen to the human eye, unseen to the human eye, all our sins were nailed on the cross. That's what it says in Colossians, 2nd chapter 13 to 15. And the Lord made a public spectacle of the evil spirits on the cross. He's taken the punishment of mankind given them peace. The evil one tempts mankind to contaminate the spirit that we can't go to heaven. And he's rejoicing over the fact that he can tempt people. But our spirits are cleansed by the blood and all our sins are crucified on the, uh, put on the cross and nailed to the cross and we have total freedom. That's why the Bible says, Isaiah 53, 5, the punishment that brought us peace was upon Punishment that brought us peace was upon him. He took away punishment and gave us peace. And he made a public spectacle of the evil spirits on the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, we read 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. There's a law. We break the law we realize we are sinners. And the sting of death is sin. Death strikes us because of sin. But praise God, Christ came to the world to destroy death. Hebrews chapter 2, 14, 15. So the children have flesh and blood. He too shared in their humanity. So that by his death, he will destroy the one who is the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all the lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. 
So as Christ hung on the cross, nailed to the cross was not just the parchment that Pontius Pilate put. Nailed to the cross were all your sins and my sins. Now we understand now why the God of Gethsemane, the Lord prayed to the Father, if possible, take this cup away from me. But not my will, but your will be done. Why did Jesus pray like that? If possible, take this cup away from me. Because Jesus knew as he went up the cross to fulfill the will of the Father, as the world sin will be upon him on the cross, nailed to the cross, the Father would take his eyes away from the Son. Because Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13 says, God is so pure, he can't look upon him. Can you look upon him? He is so pure. And Christ knew when everybody sins, past, present, and future, all there on the cross, Father would take his eyes off the Lord. And that's what Jesus, if possible, would have tried to avoid. So he could not bear separation from the Father, even for a few hours, six hours. You can imagine if for eternity, only those six hours, the Father and the Son were separated. And the prospect of being separated from the Father was so daunting on Jesus that he says, possible, Jesus come away from me. So then, the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Enduring the cross is not the pain of the cross. Enduring the cross is separation from the Father in heaven. He went through that. But the joy set before him, and that joy was you and me will be with him in heaven forever and ever. So one day we leave this world and we go to heaven with the spirits. Later on, body will follow, follow when the race to life. But now before Christ comes, if we leave this world, body goes to dust, spirits go to Jesus. And he probably tell all of us, well done, good and faithful servant. And our going to heaven would be Precious to God. Psalm 116 verse 15. Precious in the sight of God at the death of the saints. Now having said this, he took away our punishment, gave us peace. He went through the shame of the cross for our sake, for the joy set before him. But then what about you and me? When we take a stand for the Lord, we will also go through rejection of people of people, scoffing of people, mocking of people, in fact, even the shame of people. Because they look at us and say, oh, these people, they need, they need a crutch. They look down upon us. And in recent past two weeks, I've been reminded again and again about the Apostle Paul's response to people who persecute him, slander him, and curse him. 1 Corinthians 4, chapter 12 and 13, he writes, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. When he slandered, he doesn't keep quiet. He is answering, answering kindly. He must be proactive, not just keep quiet. That kind of faith can only come from God. Ask him for that faith. So sometimes, he took away our shame on the cross because today they have got forgiveness of sins. We are going to go to heaven. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. There is no shame. Only joy. Having said that, people of this world who do not know the Lord, for them, we are the smell of death. For those who are saved, we are the fragrance of life. So when you take a stand for the message of the cross, some people will scoff at us, mock at us, criticize us, slander us, persecute us. Curse us, it will happen. And there will be, maybe sometimes, like the Apostle uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy was at one point of time a little bit ashamed. He had shame because of the fact that he was in prison for the gospel. And in uh, 2 Timothy 1 8, Paul writes to him, Don't be ashamed. 
ashamed because of shame. Ashamed is actually a, probably a uh, verb, I think. I think being, sh- uh, sh- being shaming is a verb. So being shamed is also uh, actual response to action. Christ human said, don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner, but join me in suffering, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So Timothy was ashamed to testify about Jesus. Ashamed of Paul the prisoner also. And Paul is not condemning Timothy, is exhorting Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 1, 11 and 12. Of this gospel, I was made a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced he's able to guard what I have understood to him for that day. Look at the way, in a subtle way, Paul is chiding uh, Timothy as if he said, Timothy, do you know whom you believe in? Do you know who you believe in? I know who I'm, I believe in. I'm not ashamed. Because I know whom I believe. To know whom you're believing in, you won't be ashamed. And he says, I'm convinced he's able to guard what I interested him for that day. So as we go to shaming people, shaming us, scoffing, mocking us, don't respond negatively, respond positively. Answer kindly to people who slander you. When they curse you, you bless them. When they persecute you, endure. Seems very, very harsh to tell that to people who are persecuted. They are not persecuted. I'm sure none of us are really persecuted in the Zoom. We are living a very comfortable life compared to others who are persecuted very badly. To tell them, don't, be, don't uh, uh, you know, endure persecution, don't complain, don't ask to go immediately. It may seem a little harsh, but that's scripture. Paul went to persecution. And therefore, if persecution comes, for some time we have to endure. It may not last uh, for a long time. According to God's will, it will last. In fact, the Lord told uh, in the book of Revelation, he, 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 he says about who will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful to the point of death. Be, uh, give the crown of life. So there will be a persecution for us. Different degrees. But then when people shame you, remember, he took the shame on the cross. He scorned the shame for the joy set before him. And just like he has fellowship with us, he's going to have fellowship with us in heaven, we'll have fellowship with him. Fellowship is two-way community, two-way fellowship. Multiple-way fellowship. We'll all have fellowship. For fellowship with us, he endured this cross, scorning his shame. So we have fellowship with him, we endure troubles we face. We endure the shame that we go through because we believe in Jesus. Some people will uh, hate us also. The Lord said in John 15 chapter, 18 to 20, if the world hates you, keep in mind he hated me first. If you belong to the world, if you belong to the world, the world will love you as its own. As if you don't belong to the world. I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. When you take a stand for the Lord, the world will hate you. 1 John 3.13, the Lord says, 1 John 3.13, Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Shaming us, scoffing at us, mocking at us, slandering us, cursing us, all part of the same spiritual, evil spiritual activities. He will want to use his people to do all this to us. Therefore, don't be surprised if the world hates you. The Lord told his own brothers, who at that time are believers, a few months before he was crucified at the Feast of Tabernacles, even at that time, his own brothers, James, Judas, Joseph, and Simon, four brothers he had. He had some sisters also. Mark 6, chapter 3 says, they were not believers at that time. The same James wrote the book of James. Or Jacob actually his name is. Jacob and Joseph and Judas or Jude. Jude is actually Jesus' brother. They weren't, they weren't believers then. He told them in John 7, chapter 7, the world cannot 
hate you, but it hates me because I testify what it does is evil. When you and me take a stand for the Lord and testify to the evil in the world, we live for the Lord and we identify evil, we expose evil. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5.11, Ephesians 5.11, have nothing to do with the uh, fruitless deeds of darkness, rather expose them. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, rather expose them. When you expose evil, expose sin, you become very unpopular. They can't compromise with evil. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, we read, Go to those who call evil good and good evil. Just to be very popular in the world, we can just sort of carry along with the people. Oh, that's okay, that's okay, you can do all that. You take a stand for the Lord, then you become unpopular. But we are called to be a people who are obedient to the Lord, not a people who are popular in the world. So shame is an integral part of Christian life. Just like for the cross, I mean, we take a stand for the cross. And even rejection is part of Christian life. Rejection for the right reasons, not for wrong reasons. The Lord told the disciples as they shared the gospel in Luke 10, 16, if anyone rejects you, he rejects me. If anyone listens to you, listens to me. If he rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. They listen to you, they listen to me. You're speaking my word. My word you're speaking. So they reject that word, they're rejecting me, not you. When they listen to your teaching, they listen to my teaching. I mean, people reject Jesus' words, they're rejecting. When they reject our words, when you speak about Jesus, they're rejecting Jesus. Why should we feel bad? People ask this question so often. How can a Christian handle rejection? Get used to it. It's an integral part of Christian calling. 1 Peter chapter 2, 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. We also have living stones, being built a spiritual house. We holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Christ. Now, for the sake of, sake of the gospel, we can sometimes feel, uh, people shame us. We shouldn't feel ashamed, simply because gospel is the power of God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because the power of God for those who are saved. The power of God unto salvation. And that's why whenever the gospel is preached, even by other people, Paul was so happy. I'm always amazed by how when he was in Rome, in prison, the people outside the prison in Rome were preaching the gospel. Some were preaching with the right motives, with love and goodwill, some out of envy and rivalry. To stir up trouble for Paul while he was in prison. What a motivation to share the gospel. Here's a man, Paul, apostle, in prison for the gospel. You know him fully well, the one he believes is preparing for a mansion in heaven, keeping in store whatever Paul is stored in heaven. He's sure of that. And there are people outside the prison, Christians, preaching gospel to stir up trouble for Paul while he was in prison. But because Paul knew the power of the gospel, he wasn't ashamed of the gospel, he rejoicing. He wrote to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. 15 to 19. Some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, some out of goodwill. What does it matter? Christ is preached, therefore I rejoice. When the gospel is shared, it's the power of God not for salvation for everyone who believes. So Paul knew fully well. If people speak with the wrong motivation also, when the gospel is shared, there's power in the gospel. People get saved. So even though Paul was in prison, indirectly, he was saving people. Because people that tell us with him, sharing gospel, people are getting saved. He's rejoicing. What does it matter? Some preach out of goodwill, love. Others out of envy and rivalry. We have that perspective of the gospel and the work of God. 
Believe me, we'll enjoy every moment of our walk with God. Ministry is a great joy. Any kind of ministry. Your ministry comes from the word administration. When God gives us gifts, we administer those gifts, that's ministry. Same root word in Greek, administration and, and ministry. Every one of us has a ministry. We are all servants of God. To do the will of God, you are a servant of God. And as you do the will of God, there's great joy in doing it simply because every small thing we do, the Lord takes note of. Hebrews 6.10 God is not unjust. He will not forget your work or the love you have shown him as you help his people and continue to help them. An ultimate reward for service is the Lord himself. He gave a very simple instruction to all his servants. John 12, 26. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Who serves me must follow me. You follow him also in the area of facing opposing people. Simple people oppose us. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Consider him, as a Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men, that you won't grow weary and lose heart. You shouldn't lose heart at all. Don't go weary. When you have an intimate fellowship with God, which is a must for every effective ministry, what will be our circumstances? We have the joy of serving. Make it a point to have constant fellowship with God. Good times, so-called bad times, joyful times, difficult times, always have fellowship. You will enjoy God. Worship Him, praise Him for who He is. Sometimes people talk to me and they ask me, when they tell, let's praise God, worship Him, uh, have testimony, they'll say, I don't know what to thank God for. I don't know why I should rejoice. No, nothing's happening in my life. My life is very, you know, drab life. I, hear, I get messages from people. The point is this. We worship him for who he is. That never changes. We worship him for who he is making us to be. Who God is never changes. Who we are in him never changes. So we rejoice. Constantly rejoice. We rejoice because we have joy. And joy is in knowing we go to heaven when we leave this world. Colossians 1.27 Christ in you hope of glory. So let's just let Jesus scorn the shame of the cross. We have to scorn the shame of the message of the cross. Because when we share the message of the cross, they'll shame us, they'll criticize us. Because the gospel is foolishness for those who are perishing. Foolishness for those who are perishing. 1 Corinthians 1.18 it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness of those who are perishing. For those who are being saved is the power of God. The same message of the cross is the power of God for those who are saved and also foolishness of those who are perishing. So foolish people will shame people who are the uh, joy of the cross, joy of the message of the cross. Don't be surprised. In fact, we scorn that shame and simply thank God we belong to him. We we'll always belong to him. We don't stop belonging to him. Once you're a child of God, you remain a child of God. He purchased us by his blood. What an awesome realization that is. He bought us by his blood. We belong to him. In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, 9 and 10, we read about how the 24 elders and the four living creatures together, they sing to the Lamb of God. As the Lamb of God takes the scroll of judgment from the hand of the one sitting on the throne, they all sing, the four uh, living creatures, 24 elders, to the Lamb. You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seas, or you were slain. And by your blood, you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Made them the kingdom and priest to serve our God, 
and they will reign on the earth. Beautiful, you know, you belong to him. Bought by his blood. So why at all feel bad for yourself when things seem to go wrong? When people shame you, criticize you, insult you, ridicule you, revile you, ignore it. Answer kindly. You belong to the Lord. I like the way it's wonderfully when uh, Paul tells his fellow passengers in their ship going to Rome as prisoners that were Rome. And then in 27th chapter of uh, Acts, verse 23 and 24, he says to all the other people, there's a threat of a shipwreck, storm on the Mediterranean Sea. They go to Rome. And, and uh, Paul tells all the other people, last night, an angel of, of the God, whose I am and who I serve, told me. The angel told him, don't be afraid. You stand trial before Caesar and uh, just describe before him. And God is racially given the lives of those who sail with him. He's telling the people, the God whom I serve, angel of God whom I serve, who, who I belong to, whose I am and who I serve. Look at that. Whose I am and who I serve. We are his. We serve him. Therefore. So Christian life, service is a great joy. Don't be put off by people, you know, re reviling you. Remember, he also was shamed, reviled, hated. But then, the joy said before, endure this cross, conning his shame. Similarly, same joy before us. They're going to be with them as he's with us in heaven. Therefore, whatever comes in the way of our serving God, let's put it away and keep on serving joyfully, faithfully, effectively, because it's God's work. He does to us by the Holy Spirit.